on November the 17th, 2012, a man named Jose Alvaringa set out from uh, the fishing village of Costa Azul off the coast of Mexico, and there's a photo of Jose. Uh, Jose was an experienced sailor and fisherman, uh, and Jose was intent on a 30-hour shift of deep sea fishing during which, you know, he hoped to catch some sharks and some marlins and some sailfish. The guy that usually went fishing with him was unable to join him that day, and so he arranged to have uh, another partner, a, a guy that he had never met. It was a, a very ex inexperienced 23-year-old that he'd never met at all. And so they got aboard their, I think it was a 23-foot, uh, just kind of a small fishing boat. And shortly after embarking, their boat, which was equipped with a single outboard motor and a refrigerator-sized ice box for storing the fish, the boat was blown off course by a storm that lasted five days, during which his motor and most of the portable electronics were damaged. They had caught about 1,100 pounds of fresh fish, but the pair was forced to dump all of them overboard to make the boat maneuverable in the bad weather. Uh, Jose Alvaringa managed to call his boss on a two-way radio and request help right before the radio's battery died. They had neither sails, nor oars, no anchor, no running lights, no way to contact shore, and the boat began to drift across the open ocean. There was a search party that was organized by Alvaringa's employer, but the search party failed to find any trace of the missing men and gave up after two days because the visibility was so poor. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and during those time, they learned to scavenge their food from whatever source presented themselves. Alvaringa said he actually managed to catch fish, turtles, jellyfish, and seabirds with his bare hands, and that's how they ate. They collected drinking water from rainfall when possible, but more frequently they were forced to drink turtle blood or their own urine. Alvaringa's 23-year-old shipmate became sick from the raw food and eventually died from starvation because every time he ate, he got sick, and so he started refusing to eat, and so the 23-year-old fisherman died. After 13 months of setting off on his journey, Alvaringa spotted land. It was land off of the, of course, he didn't know this, but it was land off of the Marshall Islands. And here's a map on the screen. It was over 6,000 miles away from where they began. He abandoned his boat, swam to shore, and was rescued. Thirteen months later. Drifting. Uh, there's also, I got a photo of him actually coming back, the big old bushy beard. Drifting is one of the most, it's one of the biggest potential dangers to nautical jobs. Uh, stories like Alvaringa's, uh, it's the exception to the rule where he was rescued and where he was saved and where he survived for that long. Most do not survive a drift like this. And so I kind of wonder, after reading this story this week, I, I just kind of got to wondering, have you ever found yourself drifting spiritually? You ever found yourself drifting? I, I was talking to someone this week, and they, as we were talking, they were uh, talking about their church attendance, but the longer we talked, uh, this guy said, you know, it was almost like a light bulb just kind of went off. He said, you know, I don't think I've been to church in like four years. But even apart from church attendance, 
There have been people that would once describe themselves as followers of Christ, but through neglect and other circumstances, they wake up one morning and they realize that I am far away from who God wants me to be. How did I get to this place? Many people just get caught up in life. They get caught up in their kids' schedules, their work schedules, and they become so busy and so caught up with other things. They don't intend to drift away from God, but after time and neglect, they find themselves off course, and they find themselves 6,000 miles away from where they began spiritually. And so as we look at the book of Exodus this morning, our passage is an anchor of sorts. It is an anchor against drift. We are reminded that drift happens, but this passage and what this passage represents helps anchor ourselves in truth. And so if you have been tracking with our Exodus series, you know that we have we have kind of just walked up to the biggest moment, the most important section of the book of Exodus. This is the section of the book that, that the book actually gets its name from. This is the Exodus moment. This is the moment where the plagues happen, and boom, it is the delivery of what God said in Exodus chapter 6. In fact, let's begin right there. Exodus chapter 6 Turn there with me if you have your Bible, and I hope that you do. Exodus chapter 6. Our passage this morning is the climax. It is the, it is the high point, the culmination of God's promise right here in Exodus chapter 6. Uh, so look at Exodus chapter 6, verse number 6 with me. It says, Therefore, say to the Israelites, this is God speaking to Moses, I am the Lord. If you remember last week, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. I am the I am. I, am, I was present with you, I am present with you, and I will always be present with you. I am the Lord, Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God, and then you will know that I am the, I am your God who brought you from out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land that I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the I am. I was always present with you. I am present with you, and I will always be present with you. This, our passage today, Exodus chapter 12, this is that moment. This is the high point of the Exodus story. And so, after chapter 6, we come to the plagues. You have probably read or heard about the plagues before. Uh, most people that have no church experience at all ha have even heard about the plagues. They've either saw the Disney movie or, or they watched uh, or maybe a flannel graph back from Sunday school in the old days, right? These plagues, there are gnats and there are frogs and there are flies and livestock dies. There's blood in the water. There's all these different plagues and there's a pattern to these plagues. And we're not going to go through all of these plagues. I just want to share this pattern with you very quickly. Moses uh, approaches Pharaoh and says, look, God says, you need to let my people go. And Pharaoh says, nope, not going to do it. And so then God brings about a plague. And Pharaoh freaks out and tells the, the Jews, he says, look, if this is, this is what's going to happen, if I have you, then get out leave. But then as Israel gets ready to pack up and leave, Pharaoh says, wait a minute. I'm going to lose all of my labor. So never mind. I've changed my mind. This wasn't that bad. You're staying. Moses approaches Pharaoh and says, look, I'm telling you, God says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, nope, ain't going to happen. Boom, there's a plague. Pharaoh says, all right, I can't take this, go. Israel gets ready to leave. 
wait a minute, I'm going to lose all my labor. Nope, nope, you're staying. Moses approaches Pharaoh. Look, God says, it, it's this pattern over and over and over and over. Nine times. And then we come to the tenth plague. And this tenth plague is really, this is what the book of Exodus is centered around. Can I tell you, this is what the Bible is centered around this moment. It's the climax of the story. And so we're going to go ahead and skip through the first nine plagues and we're going to fast forward all the way to Exodus chapter 12 for the tenth and the final plague. Look at verse number one of chapter 12. It says, The I am, the Lord, said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Now, I just want to pause there for a moment. This pattern that has taken place. If you were to read Exodus 7 through 11, what you would see during this pattern is, it is it's all narrative. It's just telling the story of Moses going to Pharaoh, Pharaoh saying no, it's just telling the story of this pattern. When we get to this 12th plague, it's like time just stops. It just slows down, and now we find some liturgy in this moment. We, we find uh, God speaking to Moses a little bit more clearly, and a, a little bit uh, more in depth about everything that's happening. And so in this moment, God looks at Moses and he says, all right, this time things are going to be different this time. It's, it's almost like God says to Moses, I want you to pull out your phone, and I want you to open up your Google Calendar, and I want you to go into settings. January is no longer going to be the first month of the year for you. Now it's going to be April. In other words, God is giving the people of Israel a new start, a new beginning. He is it's a new identity for them. I am making a change in your life. It's a whole new beginning for the Jews, and we're going to get into this more a little bit later, but let's keep reading for now. Verse number three. He says, Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people that there are. You are to, to, to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. You know, so if you've got a college kid, you might want to get a bigger lamb, right? Because they eat more. Or if you've got me, you might want a bigger lamb. But the point is, God says to Moses, look, we don't want too much. We don't want leftovers. We need to be able to cook quickly and be ready. One lamb per household. And if you can't eat it all, share it. Share with the neighbor. Get two families together and share this moment. All right, so let's keep reading. Verse number five. The animals you must choose must be year-old males without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must come together and slaughter them at twilight. All right, And so there is this mass moment. This is important, and we're going to tie all of this together a little bit later. But there is this mass moment when everybody has their lamb and everybody comes together and slaughters their lamb at one moment. Verse number 7. Then they are to take some of the blood from this lamb, put it on the sides and the top of the door frames of their house where they eat the lamb. And that same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. In other words, God is saying, look, there is no time to boil the meat. 
Your pots are already packed. We are getting ready to go. There's no time to make lamb chops. Just put that thing on a spit and roast it over the fire. He says the, with bitter herbs, that points us to the bitterness of Egypt. We learn that a little bit later as the Passover celebration takes more form. Uh, but let's keep reading. In other words, cook quickly. Everything's packed. Just put it on a spit, roast it over the fire, and eat that thing. Uh, let, let's keep reading. Middle of verse 8. Same night, eat meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast, right? We do not have time to let bread rise. And so just leave the yeast out, make the bread, cook it. He says, do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with the head, the legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, burn it. This is how you're to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. He says, shoes on, staff in hand, shirt tucked in, your running shoes are on, get ready to leave at the drop of a hat. Eat quickly. We are getting out. We're going somewhere, and we're going somewhere in haste. Verse number 12. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt, and I will strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all of the gods of Egypt. I am the I am. I was always present with you. I am present with you, and I will always be present with you. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. The blood from the Lamb that you have spread on your doorposts will be a sign to you. And when I see that blood, I will pass over you. And no destruction, no destruction from this plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. When I see the blood on that doorframe, your firstborn will be safe. You will be safe from my judgment. Beginning in verse number 14, God then begins to explain the feast of the unleavened bread and what that's to look like for Israel. Now, I want to just fast forward. We're just going to kind of fast forward through the unleavened bread. We're going to jump down to verse number 24. There's one more section here that's really interesting for our purpose this morning. Verse number 24. He says, obey these instructions as a... What, what are those next two words? Lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. In other words, do this from here on out. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as He has promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you what does this ceremony mean to you, then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of, is, of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. And then the people bowed down and worshipped. And the Israelites did just what the Lord had commanded. Now, there are three themes there are three themes of rescue in this liturgy of Exodus chapter 12. The first one we have already talked about uh, a, a little bit there is that God rescued the Jews to an entire new way of life. This is what we talked about briefly with that calendar. God says, listen, I am taking you out of Egypt to a whole new, I am delivering you to a whole new way of life. I am giving you a new identity. All of that that I had promised your ancestors, I am getting ready to fulfill in this moment with you. You're new. You're going to be different. You're going to be changed. New identity. 
And so, year after year after year, on a certain month, on a certain day, slaughter a lamb and remember that I have given you a new identity. Remember that I have given you a whole new way of life. Do this as a lasting ordinance. And do it to remember that I'm giving you a new identity, that you are my people. and What I have done for you. The second theme of rescue that we see is that God rescues them to a whole new land. I love the imagery here. You know, I, I think... I think most of our parents taught us that we are supposed to slow down when you eat. Uh, how many moms in the room? If you're a mom, raise your hand, right? Moms, listen, I know you. Y'all worry like there's, you, you know, you worry like crazy. Anybody have, anybody, your kid ever start choking? And, and you freak out? What's the next thing you say to your kids? Slow down. Don't eat your food so fast. Chew it 30 times before you... You ever try to chew your food 30 times before you swallow it? There's like nothing even... You're like chewing spit by the time you get done. Right? But this is, this is what we teach our kids. Not in this moment, though. This was the original fast food. Just spit roast that thing over the fire, eat it, burn any leftovers, and be ready to move and be ready to move fast. Why? Because we're going somewhere new. We've got a new land. We're going to a whole new place, a whole new land. They're not going to be punching the clock for Pharaoh any longer. No more making bricks. They're headed somewhere new, the place that God had promised their ancestors. So that's the second theme. And then the third theme is this. That God rescued them by His grace. It's by His grace. On that night, as God moved through Egypt, the firstborn of every family would die. But God said through Moses, if you Jews would take the blood of that lamb that you're slaughtering and put it on the door frame of your house, it'll be a sign that when I come through Egypt and I see that blood on your home, you will be saved. God gave the people a way of escape he didn't have to. They didn't deserve it. But by His grace, out of His... What was that phrase you used in the catechism reading earlier, brother? Out of His good pleasure. Just because that's what God decided to do. I want to save The Jews still practice this to this day. Now, it's changed its form a little bit, but year after year, traditional Jewish people will sit down to a meal right about the same time that we're celebrating Easter. They will sit down to a meal of lamb, and they will go through this ritual. Year after year, for thousands of years, they have been doing this. Why? Because God told them to do it to remember. God gave them the Passover celebration as an anchor against drifting away from them. It's an anchor to remind them of their identity, to remind them of why they have the land they have. It's an anchor to remind them of how God rescued them, how he saved them. And here's the deal. I love the connections from the Old to the New Testament here. You cannot miss. I, I would be an, an idiot preacher if we didn't talk about the connections here. You can't miss it. 
There is a reason that John the Baptist stood and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There's a reason why Paul says in Corinthians, Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And that connection is found in Luke chapter 22. It's the night before Jesus was crucified. And he is celebrating this with his disciples. He is celebrating the Passover with his disciples. And in that moment, Jesus introduces a new covenant to his people. It's a covenant that we recognize and we practice to this very day. And we're going to practice it this morning. We're going to take some unleavened bread And we're going to take the cup and we're going to allow that past moment in history to define our present moment. You know, just as the Jews that still go through the steps of Passover and they allow that past moment to define their present moment, to remember their identity, to remember where their land came from, to remember that God rescued them. We take the bread and the cup as a stark reminder. I am not who I used to be. I'm not that person anymore. My identity is different than it used to be. I used to be a scoundrel. I used to be heavens but now i am a child of god almighty and i have a new land that awaits me a land where there is no more death or no more mourning no more crying no more pain anymore there's no more worrying about the craziness of this world there's no more turning on the news and just getting upset because of everything that you see there's no more worry about raising your children in a godless culture And it is all because of the grace of God. God. It's all because of Jesus, because because His grace, because He gave His life as a ransom for many, because His body was broken, because it was whipped and beaten and nailed to a tree. It's because His blood was shed as He hung on that cross and that life energy from His body poured out of Him. It's because his love was steadfast enough to take the punishment that I deserve for my sin and my sin nature. And his grace was big enough to pay for my sin. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. And when he stood with his disciples, he explained to them, here's what's getting ready to happen. And I know you don't understand it, and I know you don't get it yet. But you're going to. I am going to give my life. My body will be broken, my blood will be shed, and it will be for you. It will be so we can have this. So we can have this relationship with one another. So that you can have a new identity. And he says to his disciples, do this to remember. As often as you do it, he's not real clear about how much you're supposed to, but he says as often as you do it, do it to remember that you have a new identity, you have a new land, and it's because of my... And so most of us were busy. Are you busy? Oh, heavens, you should have lived my week. Can can I just tell you about my morning? Can I just tell you very quickly? No, I'm going to rewind. I'm going to rewind. This week, um, many of you may remember uh, the McCoy family. Uh, Corey, his wife, Laura, son Bentley, 
used to attend here. Um, some issues there, but uh, a while back, Corey started coming back to church. I get to lead him to Christ in my office. But last Sunday afternoon, Corey passed away from a motorcycle accident. And uh, had the opportunity, uh, the privilege, to preach his funeral on Friday. And um, got the privilege to share the gospel with his family. And so I spent quite a bit of time uh, preparing for that. And I didn't have my sermon done. And Saturday we had a birthday party for Mr. Jude. And it got to the end of the night, and I still didn't have, I didn't have this done. I wasn't ready, you know. And so I thought, I, I've got to, uh, I've got to finish getting this ready. But I was falling asleep while typing. I just couldn't do it. And I don't, it was about 11.30. I walked upstairs, and I told my wife, I said, I just can't do it anymore. She said, are you done? And I said, I'm not. But I, I can't. i got to go to sleep. I'll finish it in the morning. Well, I get to church this morning, everything is broken. Everything is broken. Nothing works. And I am scurrying around, turning this off, trying to get this to work. I fix this, and all of a sudden this breaks. And it's like, what in the world is happening here? And you know what happens on the inside? I, I am this, I, I'm kind of a stonewall emotionally. The worst thing in the world could happen, and I'll just be going... On the inside, though, my gut is churning. You can't see it from here, but on the inside, my gut is churning. And so this morning, that's what's happening. I am just, I, <laughs> my sermon's not done. Uh, like, I, I, we finally got all of this fixed. And so I just bolted downstairs and I sat down and, <laughs> gotta finish this came upstairs and Matt said you were downstairs a long time that's not like you and I said I just finished my sermon he said oh that's definitely not like you we lead, we lead busy 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 lives right there's hardly any time to do anything I, I'm leaving in the morning to head to Springfield and I'm going to be there for like five, four or five days and my lawn needs mowed. I don't have time to do that. Our culture is seeing the effects of consumerism. We, we live such fast-paced, busy lives. There's no time to do anything that most people Sunday morning is the only day that they get to maybe sleep in a little bit or get some things done around the house. And so what happens is many people will wake up on Sunday morning and they'll think, well, what is the inv investment versus the outcome reward? Should I get up, get ready, and go to the church gathering, or should I sleep in a little bit and, and have some time to catch up with things around the house? And, and look, Hopefully most of you know me well enough to, by now that you know that I am not all about numbers. I, I don't measure my value or my success as a pastor by whether or not the pews are packed. That, that's not me. I'm, I'm not that guy, right? But let me just encourage you. And, and maybe even those that may be watching on the live stream or will watch later on Facebook or YouTube. The gathering of the church, not church attendance, but the gathering of the church is so very important. I, I believe it is absolutely necessary for the people of God to gather with one another. Why? Well, there's a lot of reasons. We encourage one another. We minister to one another. We reason the Word of God together. But can I tell you something? This is an anchor that keeps us from drifting. 
This is an anchor that roots us to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why do we gather on Sunday? Because that's the morning that Jesus rose from the grave. After taking our punishment, after his body being broken and his blood being shed, he came back to life and rose from the grave on Sunday morning. And that's why we gather, to remember that he is still alive. And he's alive in me. And this, this gathering is an anchor that keeps us from drifting. Call me legalistic all you want, but if you show me someone who is neglecting the gathering of the church, I can promise you their relationship with God is and will suffer. The gathering is an anchor against drift in our spiritual walk. And I want to encourage you, be a people that rises up against an Egyptian-like culture. A people that says, here we are, this is important, we're not going to drift, we're going to anchor ourselves to what Jesus did for us on the cross, how he suffered and bled and died for us so that we could have life, so that we could have a new identity, so that we could have a new land by his grace. And we're going to anchor ourselves to the gathering of God's church just as he told us to. And we're going to gather and we're going to anchor ourselves in his resurrection. Because spiritual things, eternal things are of way more value and they are of way more importance than anything else that we could be doing. Period. Let me end with this. In the book of 2 Kings, uh, we learn about a young king named Josiah. Previous king of Israel, uh, Josiah's dad, uh, he was a scoundrel. A terrible, terrible king. Un under his reign, Israel had drifted so far away from God. Uh, there were idol worship places all over Israel. It, I mean, Israel had just become terrible. Well, Josiah becomes king. And the Bible says, I, I believe it was on, I believe it was his 18th year of reign. And so Josiah is now in his late 20s. In his 18th year of reign, Josiah begins to collect money to renovate the temple of God. And, and, and he sends people in priests to go begin cleaning up the rubble of what used to be the temple of God. And there's a certain priest, and he is in there, and he's maybe, I don't know, sweeping up the corners or something. And, and, and as he moves this stone that has fallen, he sees this book. And he takes this book to Josiah, King Josiah, and it is the book of the law. It's God's Word. And he gives it to Josiah. And Josiah begins to read. And the Bible says he rends his clothes. He rips his clothes. That was a sign of repentance. And he gathers the people together and he begins to read the word of God to the people. You want to know what happened next? They celebrated the Passover together. Why? Because for 77, 80 years, they had forgotten all about God. And they needed an anchor to drift. To, to, they needed something to anchor them against the drift that had happened in their life. And so they did the very thing that God said to do to remember who you are, where you're, why you are where you are, where you're headed. And then it was by his grace. He celebrated Passover. And so this morning, I want you to be safeguarded against drift. I want you to be firm in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that doesn't happen because you're a deacon doesn't happen because you're a pastor. doesn't be, happen because you're a sound man or a CR leader 
or a trustee. It doesn't happen because you put money in an offering plate. It happens because you remember what Jesus did for you. It happens because you stand firm in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It happens because your life is utterly and completely and totally dependent upon Jesus. Root yourself in that. Anchor yourself to his truth and to his grace. And so we're going to partake in communion this morning. We're going to practice it. But before we do, we have to acknowledge the words that Paul gave us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is what he said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. For you. By my grace, for you. Do this to remember. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it to remember what I did for you to remember. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. This is why I am who I am. Because Jesus died for me. I am proclaiming the Lord's death for me until He comes. So then, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. And so everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment upon themselves. Paul says, look, your life needs to be rooted and anchored in who Jesus is and His grace. And if it's not, don't partake. Don't partake. He says every man ought to examine himself. And so the ladies are going to come forward and Gary's going to come forward. We're going to have just kind of a time uh, of music, a time of response where that you can examine yourself. That you could pray to God, that you can come before His throne of grace with boldness and confidence because of what He's done for you. And if there is anything in your life that is hindering your relationship with Jesus Christ, get rid of it. Take care of it. Confess it before God. Jesus, uh, God says in in 1 John chapter 1, He said, if you would confess, confess your sins, I am faithful, and I will forgive you of your sins. Isn't it good to know? That we have, Look, I don't know if, if you're anything like me. I'm going to just be honest and vulnerable for a minute. I am a screw-up. <laughs> My sister is right there. She has known me for 43 years. She can tell you, I'm a screw-up. But I am so glad that I have a God that whenever I approach Him, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, but He looks at me with forgiveness. So let's pray together. And I encourage you to examine yourself before we approach the table of God. Father, in the name of